Good morning, everybody. We're going to begin Chapter 5, Section 1, Increasing and Decreasing Functions. This begins on page 305. And, you know, they begin this section with definitions, and I just want to go ahead and, and break it down in short how to understand when a function is increasing and when a function is decreasing. And in short, when is a function increasing? Well, as x gets bigger, our function gets bigger. The y coordinates are going to get larger. So as the x coordinates get larger, the y coordinates get larger. When is a function decreasing? Well, as x gets larger, the function gets smaller. In other words, as the x coordinates get bigger, the y coordinates get smaller. Graphically, we could visualize that as well. Uh, numerically speaking, algebraically speaking, one of the numbers getting bigger, one of the numbers getting smaller uh, in terms of f of x, in terms of the y coordinate. Now, how do we bring this all together? How are we able to use this and apply calculus here? Well, the first thing we want to do is find what is called a critical number. And there might be more than one critical number. What does that mean? Well, a number is a critical number, so our number is going to come from the domain. It's going to be an x number. It's going to be an x coordinate. So an x coordinate is a critical number if f prime of c equals 0 or if f prime of c does not exist. Let's think about when f prime of c does not exist. When we have some jump discontinuity, when we have potentially a vertical asymptote, so any type of extreme x value uh, that is going to uh, really disconnect our graph. And then also, what about f prime of c equal to zero? Well, remember what f prime is, right? It's a derivative. It's the instantaneous rate of change. It's just basically representing a slope. When slope is positive, so in other words, when f prime of x is greater than zero, we will get to this example in just a moment, but when f prime of x is greater than zero, we're saying that the instantaneous rate of change is greater than zero. We're saying that that slope is positive. So we're going to be working with a bunch of uh, tangent lines that are simply uh, increasing positive linear equations. Now, when f prime of x is less than zero, well, that means we're working with a tangent line that is potentially decreasing. But notice as we bring this all together, what about when f prime of x equals zero? What if our tangent line equals zero? Well, that means our slope is zero. And if you guessed it correctly, when a slope is zero, we are referring to a horizontal line. Notice what happens here with this photo. If you have a picture of a graph, and you take all of these different instantaneous rates of changes, so you have all of these different looking uh, tangent lines made up on a graph, well, if you have a bunch of positive sloped tangent lines, eventually, if you want to turn a corner or if you want to uh, sort of go over the hill, eventually you will run into a situation where you will have an x value that will give you an instantaneous rate of change equal to zero. Now, this isn't always going to happen, but it'll happen anytime you have an increasing uh, to decreasing function, a decreasing to increasing function. We will define these in the next section as relative maximums and relative minimums. You see here that if we have a bump on the graph, well, that's the highest point on the graph. We would call that a relative maximum. How do you know you have a relative maximum? Well, you're going to be a critical point. And if there is a turnover here, as we go from positive slopes, positive instantaneous rates of change, eventually we'll hit zero and we'll begin having negative instantaneous rates of change. That value there, whatever made that zero, that critical number, because we had this turnover, we would refer to that as a relative maximum. Now, I'm getting carried away here. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's think back to what we need to be doing here in 5.1 exercises. For problem number 13 here, we're being told to find the critical numbers, any critical numbers that it might have, and also interpret where does this function increase and where does this function decrease. So we need to know what interval or intervals is this function increasing? And when, when is this function decreasing? Now, again, look at number 13 here. 2.3 plus 3.4x minus 1.2x squared. So notice this is a quadratic equation. A quadratic is a parabola. A parabola is either going to open up or it'll open down. So you decide which way is this one going to open. Well, if you guessed it, the x squared determines it. What is the coefficient in front of the x squared? It's a negative 1.2. So this parabola here is going to open downward. And we see here for a parabola opening downward, at some point, 
This graph is increasing. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but then it stops and begins to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Notice that turnover. Notice that change there. That we have all of these positive tangent lines over here. The instantaneous rate of change, because we're increasing, we're getting positive tangent lines with positive slope. Eventually, we're going to hit a point here where we have a horizontal tangent line. In other words, f prime of x is zero. And then once we make that turn, all of these tangent lines begin to have a negative slope. So f prime of x is less than zero. So this point right here, this point that changes everything, that is our critical point. If we can determine what that point is, then we can determine which intervals are increasing and decreasing. Let's try it out with this example right here. Let's first take the derivative of the following quadratic equation. So our derivative here for y with respect to x, well, again, notice here that the first term is a constant. It goes away. Our second term, 3.4x, well, the derivative of that term is just 3.4. And now the derivative of minus 1.2x squared. Take the exponent and multiply. Negative 1.2 times 2 is negative 2.4. And now subtracting 1 from the exponent, x to the first power is simply x. We have our derivative for the quadratic. And again, keep in mind here that the derivative of a quadratic equation is going to be a linear equation. The derivative of a linear equation is a constant. The uh, derivative of a constant is always 0. So it always kind of knocks it down a peg when you take a derivative. A fifth power derivative becomes a fourth power. That derivative becomes a third. That derivative becomes a second power, etc. So something to think about there. So what are we doing here? We want to know. We got to find the critical numbers. We find the critical numbers when f prime of c equals zero. We can set a linear equation equal to zero. Let's do exactly that. Setting our equation equal to zero. And now solving for this variable x here. Let's add this term over here. We now have 2.4x equals 3.4. Dividing off the 2.4, right here when we divide off by the 2.4, uh, we are going to get x equal to approximately 1.416. Now, if you thought ahead here, we could convert this into a fraction, right? 2.4x equals 3.4. Well, that's the same thing as 24x equals 34. So x is the fraction 34 over 24, which is 17 over 12. And just to let you know here, these numbers here, right, they're the exact same number. Anytime you have a decimal that is repeating, you know that you can write it as a fraction. What does that fraction look like? It just so happens to be this fraction here, 17 over 12. So we'll scoot this up just a little bit more. But what did that do for us? That just told us our critical number. That was the first part. That's part A. When you look at your homework here for 5.1, part A says find the critical numbers. We found our critical number. That's 17 over 12. We can go up here and write it. The critical number is x equals 17 over 12. But now what do they want us to do for part B and C? It says find the intervals where our function is increasing and decreasing. As we saw, an upside down quadratic is going to have a part that's increasing and it's going to have a part that's decreasing. That's common knowledge for us. We can already determine that interval here. What it's saying, though, is that this high point right here, one thing we called before, we called that the vertex of a quadratic. Well, this vertex here just so happens to have the x coordinate 17 over 12. That's what that x-coordinate there is. But what are we doing here? Using the critical numbers, we are taking our interval from negative infinity to positive infinity, and we are breaking it apart into separate intervals. We are breaking apart this number line, this infinite number line. We're breaking it apart by the critical numbers. Here, 17 over 12. So in other words here, we're testing two intervals here. We're testing the interval from negative infinity to 17 over 12, and we're testing the interval over here from 17 over 12 to positive infinity. Do these intervals here, are they increasing or are they decreasing? That's what we want to know. 
the way that we find out algebraically is we are going to choose any number from these two intervals. It can be any number you want from this interval and any number you want from this interval. That's called our test number. We are going to test each interval by arbitrarily choosing any number we want. Me personally, I'm going to choose the easiest numbers to possibly work with. So over here, I'm going to work with zero, right? Zero falls in this interval. So I want to know what is this function here when x is zero. The easiest number to work with over here would be maybe two. So I'm going to use x equals two as a test number. So we're going to take each of these values here, and we are going to plug them in, not into our original equation, but we are going to plug it in to our derivative here. If the derivative is greater than zero, when we plug this number in, then it means for that interval, it's increasing. If the derivative is less than zero, then it means for that entire interval, it is decreasing. So let's try that out there. We found our derivative to be 3.4 minus 2.4 times x. If we let x equals zero, then this becomes 3.4 minus 2.4 times zero, which is 3.4. That number is positive, right? This number here is positive, which means this interval here is increasing. Likewise, when we take the test number two and plug it into our derivative here, what happens? 3.4 minus 2.4 times two becomes 3.4 minus 4.8, which is a negative 1.4. We get a negative value here, which means that our rate of change is going to be negative which means we're decreasing. So we are decreasing from this interval here. Of course, we had that understanding when we graphed it that because this quadratic is flipped upside down, then as we move from left to right, as we move from negative infinity to 17 over 12, we're increasing. But once we hit that critical number, we begin to decrease. We see that graphically with the upside down quadratic, but now we have shown it using our derivative test here. You take, the, you take our derivative, the first derivative here, just take a derivative, set the derivative equal to zero, and solve. Whatever solution or solutions you get here, those become your critical number. Once you find the critical numbers, break apart your infinite number line into intervals and test each of the intervals. If you get a positive number when plugging in your test number, it means that entire interval is increasing. Come over here and plug in negative three, negative seven. It doesn't matter. Choose any number from this interval and you will get an outcome that is positive, therefore increasing. For any number in this interval, its exact rate of change is going to be negative. Choose any number you want. We just so happen to choose two. You can choose any number. Plug it into the derivative. You will get an output that is negative. It's saying that at that value of x, your rate of change is negative, which means you are decreasing. So increasing on the first interval, decreasing on the second. Looking here at problem 16, 5.1 exercises, we have the function 2 thirds x cubed minus x squared minus 4x plus 2. Now keep in mind, when we take the derivative of this function, because our function is cubic, when we take the derivative, the derivative of this function will be a quadratic. We're always dropping the peg down uh, with our polynomial functions. So again, what are we being asked to do here? We want to find, for this function, we want to find any critical numbers so that we then can test each interval for our function to determine where we are increasing or decreasing. So those are the three things here. Find the critical numbers, find the intervals where the function is increasing, find the intervals where the function is decreasing. Those three things, critical points, increasing, decreasing. Go ahead and try it out here. First step, find the derivative of our function. So find f prime of x. We do so by looking at the polynomial and using our power rule. Exponents 3, 3 times 2 thirds is 2. Why do we know that? 3 times 2 is 6, 6 divided by 3 is 2, giving us 2x squared. All right, subtract 1 from our exponent. Minus x squared, derivative is minus 2x. The derivative of minus 4x is minus 4. The derivative of a constant is 0, we don't worry about it. Notice again here that our derivative function is a quadratic. The aim here is to find the critical numbers, so we will set our derivative equal to zero. So f prime of x, we're just taking this notation here, 
and we're just throwing that aside and we're making it a zero. It says set the derivative equal to zero. So we're setting this notation here equal to zero. Right? When we say set it equal to zero, we're saying set it equal to zero. So when we set it equal to zero, we just ignore this part right here. I'm going to move down to the side over here and say that our function f prime of x is now equal to zero. So what that means is this is equal to zero. But I want us to notice here what's common for each of these terms. They're all even, but factor out of two. Factoring out of two, we leave behind x squared minus x minus two. We do this because this uh, trinomial looks easier to factor. This two here, when we divide it on each side, it goes away. So we're left with zero equals the following trinomial. Well, this trinomial can easily be factored into the product of x minus 2 and x plus 1, right? Minus 2x plus x is minus x. Minus 2 times 1 is minus 2. Setting each of these factors equal to 0, we see here that x equals 2, and x also equals negative 1. Why do we know that? When x minus 2 is 0, adding 2 to each side, we get 2. When x plus 1 equals 0, subtracting 1 from each side, we get negative 1. So again, these are the critical numbers. We get two critical numbers this time. Interesting how that happened. The last example, our derivative was linear, and we had one critical number. This example, our derivative is a quadratic, and we ended up with two critical numbers. Now, that isn't always going to happen, but you remember that when you end up with two solutions for a quadratic, this is kind of the same thing, right? You're setting this equal to zero, so you're basically solving a quadratic equation exactly what you're doing. Okay, so what did we do before? Once we find our critical numbers, we are now going to use those two numbers to break apart our infinite number line. This starts at negative infinity and it ends at positive infinity. We are using the numbers negative one and two. So what have we done here? We have broken apart our number line into three different three intervals uh, for this example here. Go ahead and move the screen down a little bit. So the first interval from negative infinity to negative one. Our second interval is from negative one to two. Our third interval from two to positive infinity. So those are the three intervals. We want to know which of these intervals are increasing, which of these intervals are decreasing. So let's find test numbers. We have to find a test any number from any of these intervals. I'm choosing the easiest ones to work with. So I'm going to choose negative two. Again, we want to, we want to plug this into the derivative function. So I'm going to take negative two and plug it into the derivative function. Now from here, that easy number to work with is zero. So we'll plug that into the derivative function. And then here, I'm going to choose now, notice we're not choosing negative one. We're not choosing two. We're not, you know, we don't want to choose the critical numbers here as our test numbers because we know what's going to happen when we plug them in. We're going to get zero. We saw right here. What are the numbers that make our derivative zero? It's those two numbers, negative one and two. So we can't use those as test numbers. We want to use any other number that falls in the open interval. So not including these, these endpoints here. So let's try negative two here by plugging it into our uh, derivative function. So this becomes 2 times the quantity negative 2 squared uh, minus 2 times negative 2 minus 4. Uh, this becomes 2 times 0 squared minus 2 times 0 minus 4. Uh, this becomes 2 times 3 squared minus 2 times 3 minus 4. Where are these positive and where are these negative? I'll give you a second there if you want to pause the video. And we're going to go ahead and write these out here. Uh, when you multiply out all of this, f prime of negative 2 becomes positive 8. f prime of uh, 0 becomes negative 4. And f prime of 3 becomes positive 8. So notice that for our test numbers, negative 2, 0, and 3, f prime of negative 2 gave us a positive number, which means this interval is increasing. Our test number zero 
gave us negative four, which means for this entire interval, we are decreasing. And lastly here for the third interval, our test number gave us a positive number. So this entire interval here is increasing. We are looking at exercise number 19, 5.1 exercises, page 313. We have the function f of x equals 4x, excuse me, we have it x to the fourth plus 4x cubed plus 4x squared plus 1. Now again, what are the directions telling us to do here? We want to first take the derivative to find the critical numbers. So part A, find the critical numbers. And then parts B and C, find the intervals where the function is increasing and decreasing. We can't find those intervals until we find the critical numbers. We can't find the critical numbers until we find the derivative. So let's first start by finding f prime of x by using our power rule. Here we get 4x cubed. For the second term here, 4x cubed, we take the derivative, we get 12x squared. For the third term, 4x squared, we get 8x. And of course, the derivative of this constant here, the 1, it becomes 0. We don't worry about it. f prime of x is as follows. But again, what do we do now? We set it equal to 0, and we solve for the variable x. The solutions of x give us the critical numbers. So we're going to set this here equal to 0. But again, I want you to be mindful that because we are trying to solve, we want to think about solving by factor. Notice we have a GCF here, greatest common factor. Not only is it factorable by x, but it's factorable by 4x. So we factor out of 4x. We leave behind here x squared plus 3x plus 2. Now again, we notice that the remaining trinomial in parentheses can be further factored. So our GCF 4x is now going to multiply the factorization of x plus 2 and x plus 1. Uh, this is going to multiply back to give us this trinomial. Now setting all of these factors equal to 0, setting the 4x equal to 0, setting the x plus 2 equal to 0, setting the x plus 1 equal to 0, again this is our zero factor theorem, some call it the zero factor property. All of this multiplies to give us a 0, so something has to give, something has to equal 0 to set them all equal to 0. If 4x equals 0, then x is 0. If x plus 2 equals 0, then x has to be negative 2. If x plus 1 equals 0, then x has to be negative 1. We have located our critical numbers. We have determined our critical numbers. We are now going to use those critical numbers to break apart our infinite number line into several intervals for which we will test for increasing and decreasing. So again, for our infinite number line, we are breaking it apart at negative 2, negative 1, and 0. So that first interval there is the interval from negative infinity to negative 2. Our second interval from negative 2 to negative 1. Our third interval from negative 1 to 0. And then on the right side there, we have that last interval from 0 to infinity. So those are the four intervals that we will test for our following function here. Where is it increasing and decreasing? So once again, we're going to go through here and find the test number for each of these intervals. For the first interval, I'm looking at potentially negative 3. Again, we will plug negative 3 into the derivative function. Uh, between negative 2 and negative 1, we don't have any whole numbers we get to work with. That's sort of a bummer. Uh, but right in between a whole number is a half of a whole number. Uh, so between negative 2 and negative 1 is negative 1.5, uh, which we can write as subtraction negative 3 over 2. Between negative 1 and 0 is negative 1 half. And between 0 and infinity is an infinite amount of numbers, just like the rest of them, but an easy one to work with is 1. So we want to plug each of these four numbers uh, separately, uh, one at a time into our derivative function. So here, negative 3 gets plugged in to this derivative function here. And let's go ahead and take a look here. I'm going to give you a moment to pause the screen if you need to, uh, to input each of these one at a time into the derivative. 
So f prime of negative 3, we get negative 24. f prime of negative 3 over 2, we get positive 3 over 2. f prime of negative 1 half, we get negative 3 over 2. And then lastly here, f prime of 1, we get positive 24. Again, anywhere we see a positive number, we know that for that interval, it's increasing. Anywhere we see a negative number here when evaluated, we know that that interval is decreasing. So where here for our function is it decreasing? Well, for f of x, when is it decreasing? It is decreasing on the following intervals from negative infinity to negative 2. And it is also decreasing, since this is negative, it is also decreasing on the interval from negative 1 to 0. Now the remaining, that's where they are increasing. So you can get an idea of the graph of your function just by understanding where it increases and decreases. So the first increasing uh, we're working with is the interval from negative 2 to negative 1. And the second interval here, notice again, we uh, our test number, when plugged it into the derivative, gave us a positive. So that entire interval will be increasing. And there we have our critical numbers, negative 2, negative 1, and 0. And we have the intervals for which the function decreases and increases. Last example here from 5.1, increasing and decreasing functions. You can pick up here page 313, exercise 22. Being told here to find the critical points or the critical numbers uh, for the following equation and also determine where this equation is increasing and decreasing. We see our equation here is y equals 6x minus 9. Now, some of us might look at this immediately and think, I recognize that equation. That is a linear equation. But we know what lines look like, right? Lines are either going to have an, uh, a positive slope, a negative slope, a zero slope, or an undefined slope. So basically, this graph here is going to look like one of those. And also notice that just, just getting this intuitive idea, this understanding that a line is going to do the same thing no matter what. It's either going to increase for eternity, it's either going to decrease for eternity, it's either going to stay flat for eternity, or it is going to stay vertical for eternity here. So which one of these is this one? Let's go ahead and think about it in terms of the derivative. Now we can see here that because it is in slope-intercept form, there's our slope. Our slope is 6. The instantaneous rate of change is a slope. When slope is positive, what does it mean? It means your line is increasing. Let's use the derivative test to show that. We take the derivative of 6x minus 9. Remember what we've been saying here. We're always dropped down a peg. The derivative of a linear is a constant. Let's see what that means here. The derivative of 6x just becomes 6. What about the derivative of minus 9? The derivative of a constant is always 0. So the derivative of a linear always is going to give us a number. And that number is always going to be our slope. So now we're being told, take the derivative and set it equal to 0. How do we set 6 equal to 0 and solve for x? Right? We don't. If you try to set this equal to 0, you get 0 equals 6, and that's not a true statement. What does that mean here for us? It means there is no solution. There is no value of x such that the exact rate of change at that value of x is 0. Why? Because the exact rate of change at any value of x is always going to be 6. Because it's the slope, right? It's the slope. The slope is 6. The exact rate of change for any value of x is always going to be 6. 6 is a positive number. So what does that mean? On our infinite number line, from negative infinity to positive infinity, there is no critical number that's going to break apart this interval. Because this number is 6 and that's positive, that means that this derivative here, if you wanted to write the notation, f prime of x, the derivative of this, go ahead for a moment change that notation. If this was the notation, then f prime of x is 6, and 6 is always greater than 0. So what does that mean? It means for this entire interval, from negative infinity to infinity, this function here is increasing. This function is increasing on the entire interval. That's because from the very beginning, at the smallest number of x you can think of, leading up to the largest number, 6x minus 9, is just going to continue to increase as x gets bigger. Keep plugging in larger and larger numbers for x. 
the function is just going to continue to get bigger and bigger. So we see here that for any linear function that has a positive slope, it is increasing for the entire interval, negative infinity to positive infinity. 